Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the October 16th Selectman's meeting. We are returning from executive session, and I'll ask uh, Selectman Bennett to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Certainly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, and one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I accept a motion to approve the minutes so for moved. October second. Yes, I wasn't there. Okay, uh, I'll second then. Uh, motion made and seconded. Uh, are there any adjustments? For the second then, I, I saw none. Nope. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Abstain. Abstain. One. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is the point of the meeting where we welcome people who, uh, first of all, welcome to all the new and friendly faces in front of us. Um, this point of the meeting, we open it up for new public business. That is something that's not on the agenda tonight that a citizen might want to bring to the attention of the selectmen. Is there anyone with new public business this evening? Mr. Getzel. Good evening, Bruce Getzel, Town Meeting Manager, Precinct 6. Uh, as you probably know, we had one of the football players get injured at the last game, uh, Andy Cronus, thank, thankful he's doing, doing good, he's going to be okay. But my qu question is, in past time when Kevin Lyons ran the ambulance, he was very kind and put a, an ambulance down there during the game. There's not one there now, and I'm wondering if, if we could approach uh, Cataldo, I think, is the one that's operating Lions now, to see if they would do an in-kind type of thing to put one of their ambulances down there during the game. I'll refer that to the town manager for follow-up. A little food for thought. It's oh, a good point, and we thank you for thank it. You. Town manager will follow up and give us a report in a future meeting. Thank you. Is there any other public business, new business, that's not on the agenda? Hearing none, I'll move to the first agenda, uh, to the agenda item number three. The board is in receipt of an application from ILL Food Services, Inc., doing business as Ely's Cafe and Breakfast, and I apologize for any pronunciation issues. Aaron uh, Arathon Likage, manager for a common vehicle license at the location. Is there someone here to speak to this? Welcome. If you wouldn't mind going to the podium, speaking into the mic so we can all hear you and the people on TV can hear you. So right behind you at the podium. Sure. If you want to help, that's fine. Please. Please. Um, what we'd like you to explain is um, the business you're opening and where it is, what the hours are, and why you need a common vehicles license. Of course, business. This is the new address, New Body Street, 435. Uh, so the new business is a food service incorporation, and it's uh, situated in Denver's uh, 435 Newbury Street. It's a breakfast cafe, and uh, it's under the name of uh, the manager is Ariton Likai, while the name of the business is Ilis Cafe. Ilis Cafe, thank uh, you. Or it? It will be opened at 7 a.m. till 15 or 3 p.m. Okay. And uh, from Monday to, to Sunday. Monday, Sunday, so seven, seven days. Seven days. Seven days. All right. Um, uh, the clerk tells me all of the application is in order. Uh, all the signatures are uh, there. Uh, Selectman Bennett, any questions? No questions. Selectman Clark, any no questions? No questions. I have no questions. Um, this is a, a town formality. We welcome you to the uh, town as a business person and wish you luck. Thank you. Thank All in favor? I'm, is that the uh, I'm sorry, was there a motion? Can I, yeah. I'll the motion. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we'll, I make a motion to approve the application as written. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in, any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 No, Opposed? No Good luck to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you're more than welcome to stay for the meeting. You don't have to if you don't want to, but um, thank you for joining us. We'll move to agenda item number four. A public hearing will be held on the application of Hardcover Inc. doing business as Hardcover Inc., 15 Newbury Street. Denise E. Boggs, manager for a change of manager at that location. Is there someone here to speak? Hi, welcome. If you too could go to the podium.
please explain the change and, and, uh, and you know who she is? Well, I have been with the company for... Uh, could you introduce yourself? I'm sorry. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Denise Boggs, and I am now the new general manager of the Hardcover Restaurant. Um, I had been the assistant there for the past four years, and the general manager gave his notice um, on September 22nd, and the owners had asked me to step in and take his place, and um, yeah, that's why I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'll start with Selectman Clark. Any questions, sir? I just looked at your, your application. You've got a... <coughs> Excuse me, an extensive background with this company at other locations, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I started in Burlington in 2000 and worked there till 2011 and then went to the Beverly Depot and then from there went to the hardcover, I would say close to four years ago, around there. Okay, have you ever had personally a problem with a liquor license at a restaurant that you've been managing? Mm, no, I haven't. I've never had to hold a liquor license for the restaurant, but I haven't had any problems with it, I guess. Okay. That's fine. Thank you, Selectman Bennett. Thank you. According to the application, it says you'll be 40 hours a week on the premise. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And Bill was right that you do have an extensive experience with this, um, op this company, so good luck to you. Thank you. Um, I see that you're uh, certified by the alcohol intervention methods. Um, I presume that's similar to the TIPS program. It is. It's what, yeah, it is. I had just, I think I just got recertified okay. maybe a year ago. And based on a question from one of my uh, uh, other selectmen, did you say this is the first uh, holding of a license you'll have? Yes, because I've only been an assistant, and usually it's the general manager, so. Okay. And you're familiar with the town bylaws, and we'll be looking for you to actually assign someone as a designate when you're not there. Okay, I, I do have someone. I don't know if that name was given to you when some of the paperwork, but I do have okay. an assistant. So the clerk reminds me that we'll remind you at the renewal process that comes up in December. Okay. And at that point, you can name someone that you trust to, to act in your stead when you're not actually physically at the restaurant. Okay. I have no other questions. If I may have a yes. follow-up question. Please. Thank you. Um, I assume as a restaurant you have a dumpster on location? We do. And are you aware there's a bylaw that prohibits commercial trash pickup before 7 a.m.? Yes, I am. You are? Okay, great. And we also <laughs> just recently passed a bylaw that um, you, as the company, would be responsible if your vendor violates <coughs> that. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? This is a public hearing. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Motion to close the Second. public hearing. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. I'll entertain a motion. Now we'll entertain a motion on the application. Uh, make a motion we approve the application as presented. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good luck. It's transferred. You're now responsible. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to agenda item number five. The board is in receipt of an application from Brookwood Park Cafe, LLC, doing business as Cafe 75 at 75 Sylvan Street. De Dana DiGennaro, manager for Common Vigil's license at that location. Is there someone to speak to that? Sir. I invite you to the uh, podium as well. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Dana DiGennaro. Um, my wife and I own Brookwood Park Cafe, LLC. We currently own a um, bar restaurant in Westford, two other corporate cafes, and we're looking to um, branch out over to 75 Sullivan Street, um, taking over the corporate cafe that's there now. Okay. Hours of Monday through Friday, um, 7.30 to 2. So this is a corporate cafe, not open to the public? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from Mr. Clark? No questions. Mr. Bennett? Um, just will repeat what I just said to the other applicant. Do you have a dumpster? The dumpster is owned by the property owner, not by us. Not by you. Okay, Correct. thank you. All set. All right. I have no questions as either. Um, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the application as presented. Second. Uh, motion made and second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good luck. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Speeding along, 
The board will hear an update from staff on recent DEP funded studies at, of our long range water system planning. Mr. Town Clerk, um, Town Manager. Joe's welcome to take this yeah, one. Yeah, Joe, you want to take the field this one? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> Not enough. Since we have we have three experts in the room, I won't do much of the talking on this, but I'll I'll introduce the topic for you. Um, we recently, we, well, I'll introduce first, we have Town Engineer Steve King, uh, Public Works Director David Lane, and uh, Kirsten Ryan from Kleinfelder, a Senior Project Manager and Hydrology, uh, Hydrologist? Hydrogeologist. Hydrogeologist which sounds like watching how water moves through rocks would be my guess. <laughs> um, so we, we have them here to provide an update to the board. We, we recently completed uh, the second of two pretty major uh, grant funded studies related to the basin. Um, the first kind of developed the baseline for us in terms of what the science says about uh, what's happening in the basin. Um, the second was an evaluation of some of our int intra basin options uh, kind of long term. Um, and we're, you received a cover letter tonight um, of a third round of grant funding that we're pursuing uh, that, that Steve and the team will talk about momentarily. It seemed like a good time to check in with the board to let you know what we've been working on and kind of where we're going. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Steve to, to walk through the presentation uh, on the screen. Hey, guys, thank you for your, uh, your time. Steve, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to make sure you guys can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm Stephen King, representing the engineering uh, DBW division. Uh, Steve mentioned the damaged DBW and our consultant Kleinfelder are here to provide a condensed update of the damaged long range water planning system uh, study that has taken place over the past two fiscal years. Uh, there's a lot of information, obviously we have two years of, of study of, of data that we want to go over, but I want to condense it and then I present to you this agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about the Water Management Act uh, constraints that we're currently up against, and we have been since 2006. Uh, talk a little bit about the Iftish River Basin and the Sustainable Water Management uh, Initiative Program that we did the study with the DEP and uh, other stakeholders as well. And then we're going to share two other items, um, some that hope the next step is us for preparing for the upcoming water management uh, permit that is uh, going to be soon due. That's water supply resiliency enhancements within the Ifrit River Basin and demand and drought preparedness. And lastly, I'll, I'll take any questions at the end or comments uh, if you guys have any. Uh, I want to go over a few things uh, to give everybody some background information on our water supply. Uh, we have three separate sources to supply drink water to Danvers and Middleton residents. Source number one is our water treatment plant. Uh, the Vernon C. Russell treatment plant <coughs> located in Middleton. That draws water from Middleton Pond, Emerson Pond, and Swamp Pond reservoirs. Uh, the water treatment plant has the capacity to produce 5.6 million gallons per day and currently averages 3.2 million gallons per day uh, yearly. Source number two is our groundwater well one located on 114 uh, in Middleton along the Ipswich River that produces roughly 0.86 million gallons per day or 860,000 gallons per day. Um, on average. That's also one well that is restricted uh, by our current permit and ruling of the 2006 Water Management Act uh, due to flows in the Ipswich River. Our third source, uh, most located in Danvers, what we call Well 2, our green sand filtration plant, is another source that we utilize, which provides us with over 980,000 gallons per day um, when we're allowed to run it if the Ipswich River flows uh, are up over 44 CFS. Uh, during the time that we want to turn the wells on. Well, we have three great water source supplies, uh, but all currently restrained by the, the uh, 2006 Water Management Act ruling. And I'll go over a few of the conditions I thought were, were prevalent and important to note uh, in this presentation. These conditions are one, six, eight, and nine in our permit. Um, condition number one, which is a big one, annual average withdrawal, we're only allowed to withdrawal on average 3.72 million gallons per day. Uh, condition number six, our firm average yield withdrawal surface for surface water is only allowed at 3.51 million gallons per day during the summer, basically from May 1st to September 30th. Uh, condition number eight, which is reflect, reflects our wells, we're only allowed to run or utilize our wells based on the Ipswich River stream flow. 
So if anything less than 15 CFS cubic feet per second, we're not allowed to run our wells at all. Anything that averages between 15 and 44 CFS, we're allowed to alternate our wells usage on the day. Anything over 44, we're allowed to run both wells as much as we need to. Uh, the next two slides that I have coming up uh, <coughs> graphically portray the disparity between our yearly averages and our summer averages. Uh, the graph that you see on, on page four, if you have the presentation in front of you, is a nine-year gauge between 2008 and 2017, showing our monthly average demand year over year and our ability to stay below that um, based on our permit and how we operate our water system. The orange line up above here is basically the 3.72 that I referred to earlier in the uh, previous slide. And we, show, we clearly stay well below that um, based on operation procedures that, I, that we do at the plant. Um, like I said, the operations team does a great job of making sure we comply with this regulation and also meet the demand of the Middleton and Danvers residents. I thought it would also be good to show, excuse me, go back one slide here. This graphic as well. This is kind of a snapshot of the past couple of years from 2014 to 2017 that shows us what we're, what we're up against as far as our seasonal cap under our permit. Um, in the previous slide, I showed our yearly cap. We're well below that cap. But now in the summer months, when it's harder, when we need that water, we're not allowed to produce it as much um, due to the either cap of 600, just under 600 million gallons per day, million gallons produced from our plant. In 2014, we're right around just over 500. 2015, we exceeded that limit. 2016, we're right up against the cap. And 2017, again, we're right between 500 and 600 gallons produced. Um, I thought this was a good slide to show that we've been extremely close to the limit or at least exceeded it in the past. 2018 18 data is still um, being worked and hopefully we'll, we'll have that soon up on, on our website. So that will bring us to uh, the next stages. Um, the Yiftus River Swimming Grant study that we uh, collaborated with Kleinfeld and other stakeholders in the Yiftus River Basin, Hamilton, Wenham, Middleton, uh, Linfield, and Topsfield. We performed two phases uh, within the study for the public water suppliers which also was assisted by Mass Water Works Association. Uh, phase one, basically to evaluate the Ipswich River Basin hydrological cycle. What comes in, what comes out, uh, simple, simple mass flow for, for water. Phase two was to quantify alternatives to supply outside of the Ipswich River Basin and develop strate strategies for future supply management uh, for our water sources. And here I just want to highlight some of the phase one key takeaways that the study revealed. Uh, I thought the biggest one, which is most interesting, is that public water suppliers are only 1% of the basin budget as a whole. So we're only withdrawing 1% of the of total 100% within that basin. <coughs> Withdrawals have actually not increased and have been steady since 1980, which I thought was another good point in, in study that Kleinfelder was able to uh, enlighten us on. And also our groundwater use is, is actually lower um, now than it was in 1960, uh, believe it or not. A couple other key points was evapotranspiration. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term. That's basically uh, evaporation of the water source through heat, heat index. That plays a significant role in the, in the basin hydrology. And then also we want to look at outside basin resources or water sharing between the entities or public water suppliers or stakeholders within the Ipswich River Basin. Can I jump in for one second, Steve? Yep. I think the, there's a lot of information on that slide, but one of the ways we've summarized that in the last couple months is um, the, you know, there's, a, there's a narrative or a notion that uh, when the Ipswich River goes dry, it, it's, uh, it's either driven by or significantly contributed to uh, by water suppliers pulling water out. But what the study, as Steve indicated, you know, 1% of the total water that moves through that basin each year is pulled out by the water suppliers. Right from, from the ground, yep. the the vast majority, somewhere north of I think seventy or seventy five percent, either evaporates back into the air or flows out to the ocean, just based on the hydrology, hydrogeology of the, basin, yeah. <laughs> of the of the basin. There's a lot of ledge; it's shallow; it doesn't percolate down and stay. Um, so we, the reason we wanted to, to provide some science for this was to answer that question, which we've struggled to respond to through the press and through some of the sort of the popular notions out there that the water suppliers drive this, that the, this problem. 
And when we look back, we see that this basin had been going dry before any water suppliers were even on the scene, just based on the hydrology in the it basin. It naturally goes dry on its own. That's correct. Uh, with, this, with the study revealed. It's, it's nothing that the groundwater suppliers are specifically doing to the Ipswich River Basin. Uh, phase two, uh, some takeaways. Obviously, Steve kind of elaborated to it. Climate change. Climate change does, drastically does affect the, the operation of the Ipswich River Basin and how the river flows on a daily basis. Uh, conservation also needs to be a priority for all public water suppliers. It, it, no matter what, we need to make sure we can conserve our water resources and use them uh, correctly to the best of their uh, ability. We also looked at a possible MWRA potential. Uh, we need further explanation in that, that resource as well. Uh, they have an excessive supply of water that they are looking to sell, and they're actively engaging uh, public water supplies in the Ipswich River Basin. Uh, they know what we're up against to see if they can support us and actually provide us with water if, if we need it, if we call for it. And then lastly, the basin has, has, en has enough water, but it's just very difficult to overcome localized shortages, and that's kind of what Steve alluded to earlier. There are spots in the Ipswich River Basin that naturally go dry. These are localized spots. I think these are some of the areas that might have been portrayed earlier in 2016 and 2017 um, during the newspaper article. So I thought that was very interesting to, to learn those outcomes. Added to phase two, we thought Danvers uh, could really use another look at increasing our water supplies. Uh, we looked at a couple alternatives as far as utilizing our wells without our permit. How much capacity resiliency does that give our water system? We also looked at increasing storage capacity at Middleton Pond as well, which I know has been a topic, and also Emerson Brook. We revisited that, situ that uh, scenario as well. Uh, we had a slight chance, of a quick look at a new well source exploration within um, another basin that Danvers is part of. Uh, again, like we spoke a little earlier, connecting to the MDRA, we thought that was an option we need to look at. And also, one that we heavily relied on is purchasing water from Salem and Beverly when we need it in a drought, drought scenario. Uh, the graphics on the following pages I'll go through, um, 10, 11, and 12, in a summary, really give you a great overview of the Phase 2A findings. So here I want to kind of out, out show, if you guys can hear, um, see me all right, with the laser pointer. Here's the outline of Danvers. And here's, our, here's where all our water supplies come from. This is Milton Pond, this is Emerson up here, and Swan Pond is right over there. So all our, all our sources are within the Ipswich River Basin. What we potentially have is a source within the North Coastal Basin, which is this area shaded in light, in light green. We need to do some further exploration and, and test drilling and, well, and installing some test welling to see how much water we can actually withdraw from this potential source of water that we have. Uh, the next graphic is basically the combination of scenarios that we, we laid out as far as maximizing our wells, increasing Emerson Brook, increasing Middleton Pond, um, and, also per, and also including demand increase. Uh, as this graphic shows right here, if we increase Middleton Pond Reservoir capacity by five feet vertically, if we were in the 2002 drought scenario, we would have zero days um, without water, so we'd be fully resilient. Although, I had to put an asterisk on that, if that's the current demand, current, current population growth. If we have any growth beyond 15%, we automatically lose any gains we do in raising Middleton Pond and also increasing Emerson Pond and Middleton Pond at the same time with a population increase. So here, this graphic shows you basically if we increase five feet, Middleton Pond by five feet and our demand increases by 15% or more, we're still looking at 74 days worth of uh, having to purchase water from an outside source. Okay. I think this, oh, there we go. This is the second graphic. This is related to the, the last graphic I just showed you. Um, to give you an example, the last scenario, 6A, shown here, this is a five-foot Middleton increase in 15% demand. If we proceeded with doing that construction inf infrastructure improvements, we would still have to spend roughly $2 million in purchasing water from Salem Beverly. 
it kind of gives you a show that like, even though we're, we're increasing our capacity, if we have any demand or population increase within Middleton and Danvers, we're still going to be required to purchase water from outside source. And again, that goes, we tested at one foot in Middleton, one foot in Emerson, two feet, three feet, five feet. And these are all in combination with using our wells to the maximum capacity that they have um, permit within the permit. And that would be purchasing $2 million. That would be 74 days worth of drought that we need that $2 million for. So some of the main takeaways that we had from phase 2A study. Oh, move too fast there. New source options are limited to outside the Ipsa River Basin, so there is potential there. Any enhancements to our water supply only satisfy our current demand, not any future demand or population growth. And it is necessary to concentrate our resources on drought management and conservation of our water supply. Which brings me to our next slide, our drought management plan. We're still working off a drought management plan that was created in 2000. Uh, we have 18 years worth of new historical rainfall data and climate data that we need to update into our drought management plan. We currently have a uh, grant request into the DEP, which uh, they'll assist and client will assist us in looking at updating our drought management plan with the new rainfall data, so it'll help us reach a certain level to our criteria on our drought, and also give us new operational triggers of when we need to turn on our wells, if necessary, or purchase water from outside sources. This is all based on what our potential could be for restrictions on our new Water, Man water Management Act permit. Uh, next steps. Basically, we apply for the grant. Uh, we're going to get roughly an 80% match. So Danvers, I think, in kind only has to be 20%. Uh, that will update our drought management plan uh, to current standards and our current permit. And then also, as required by the new Water Management Act, we need to come up with a minimization plan, which basically spells out uh, summaries of all, summarize all Danvers' efforts to reduce impacts in the basin for our water supplies and assist in preparing the town for potentially new Water Management Act permits, feasibility of alternatives to existing sources, um, our options for those, and, and compare dam resource options uh, within the basin. I know that was a lot of information. Uh, I'll definitely take any questions you guys may have. It's, like I said, it's two years worth of information or, and data that we try to condense in a, in a presentation, but more than happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Selectman Clark, would you like to start, sir? Do you want to start? Well, I think you, you, you've shown a yeah. lot of interest in the yeah. subject. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Steve, if you can't hear me. I'll try to speak so you can hear me. Um, I'm deeply concerned that we cannot consider excavation at the Emerson Brook location as part of the enhancement of a reservoir involving Emerson uh, Brook in Middleton. If we modeled a potential reservoir compared to the Putnamville Reservoir that was done in the 1950s by the Beverly Salem Water Board, it was my understanding at one point that we would be able to store upwards of a year's supply of water at Emerson Brook if the, if the swamp was excavated. Now I understand that a new or under more current rules and regulations, you can't do it. It's all a bunch of bureaucratic BS that we have to deal with with this, because mm -hmm. there's water 46 inches a year is coming down in Danvers. We have an aquifer that's very active. In fact, I think you alluded to a, a location in Danvers that I won't talk about necessarily, but I know that my farm is actually in a similar basin. Uh, these maps that I saw were from the United States Department of Agriculture, not from local. And we have a huge area in Danvers running approximately from Whipple Hill over to PB114 uh, that's got a tremendous potential <laughs> water storage capa or water capacity. What it is, we don't know deep yeah, beneath correct. the surface. But I know I have a surface well that I can draw 
indefinitely from. The town has a relatively successful one at Gates Field that they allege are, is pulling out 35 gallons a minute, uh, unstoppable for the fields over there. I don't know how fast that is or whether it's truly accurate or not, but uh, I, I've certainly seen the gun over there and I'm told that it's coming from a well on that property. I realize this is surface water and you've got to go deep to get the, the water that, that you can use and there's no river as such working there. But I do know that we have essentially an underground river running right through the middle of Danvers. And I hope that we could explore that possibility more because that's not in the Ipswich River watershed. Uh, watershed. It's in the coastal water plain. So it shouldn't be uh, affected by that. I think you might want to relate to the public what MWRA was looking for for an attachment fee to connect to their system. It's great they want to provide us with water, but it was my understanding, I think we were told several years ago, it was in the order of almost $20 million cost to us to get our first drop of water from them between fees and constructing a water main down to Linfield to connect it to would be adequate. Uh, what you're is still the correct in that, in that, You're still correct in that figure. It's, Thank you. It's, it's, it hasn't changed too much, but it's roughly around $20 million. Thank you. $20 million dollars for connection fees. Secondly, or thirdly, I guess, what is Beverly Salem? What rate are they charging us for water? I, it's my understanding they're charging us a regular retail rate for the same water that just flows four more miles down the Ipswich River and they extract out of Topsfield rather than us extracting it out of Middleton or Danvers. We, we, we pay two specific rates. We pay a rate for Salem Beverly to treat their water, and we also pay a rate to Beverly as well. Uh, for the water to convene through Beverly's water system. We're negotiating that uh, as we speak right now. All right. But again, Salem Beverly also has the same constraints um, as us, so they're not, they, they can't be 100% our partner and we can't contract with them to, to potentially buy water from them at any point that we need it. No, that's my understanding also. They have a third location in Topsfield that could be used as a reservoir that they bought several years ago and they may be under similar constraints that we are in, at Emerson Brook, but the potential if we worked together in the North Shore with Beverly, Salem, Danvers, Topsfield, uh, Middleton, we should have, I think, a little more clout with the state to get some realistic uh, uh, solution to this problem. It's not, I think Steve used the phrase, it's not a supply problem, it's a storage problem. We, we've got all the water we need, but it all goes out to the ocean, or much of it, Correct. in the spring. And uh, I think it's ridiculous. In Topsfield, <laughs> the Topsfield Fair can't dig a well on their property, yet we've got a, a parking lot that was flooded throughout the entire fair. It doesn't make sense. It's stupid. Yeah. And I understand Topsfield and Wenham can't even dig wells privately in their towns for the individual people without getting permission from the state. Again, absurd regulations. We've got to get some reality into what is happening. There's plenty of water here. I, I, I'm only talking because I'm not connected to the water system. I've had two wells for over 25 years <coughs> on my farm. I don't s contribute to your problem, but I certainly, I can get an, an, enough water on my farm to supply all that I'll ever need in the future. I think it was, it was great to see all the stakeholders that were involved, um, a lot of the meetings that we held during the uh, swimming grant studies. Um, having Beverly there, having Salem there, PBD, uh, Linfield, Topsfield, uh, everybody sat around the table. And I think we brought up a couple of times the ideas of regional sharing um, as far as cost and, and possibly storage, storage options as well. Um, something we can definitely look into further uh, at, at this point. I'm not sure what everybody's other towns are really feeling about that, that same, how you're feeling as well. But we're getting very close to being locked in for another 10 years. I, I believe, aren't we, Dave? Is it 10 years for permit? We're still waiting for the order conditions to see what the actual permit, and we haven't even started the process yet. Correct. Thank you, Dave. So, you can come right. Yes. Um, I would just offer that, so Massachusetts Water Works Association, Jen Peterson, she worked with us on the grant for both phases, and she was a great partner in sort of getting all the people in the room. Um, she's offered to coordinate um, an update for legislators, and that might be a good opportunity for, you know, the town and 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 their and your legislators and maybe some of the other towns to to talk about these issues because, you know, the folks at the table during this 
this, all these meetings and the modeling, you know, we're more technical, you know, staff folks. So I think it's you know, probably good to have town managers, selectmen, you know, top the conversation with legislators in terms of where do we go from here. I think there's one other thing that we didn't mention and you haven't mentioned here is the possibility of an inter basin transfer uh, from the Merrimack River through North Andover. I think there's a one, less than a one mile gap along 114 in Middleton from the Middleton North Andover line to, um, I forget the name of the cross street on, on 114, where you could, you could connect in the system from North Andover. And that's another whole different basin. But that creates a whole different list of uh, uh, limitations, I understand, to go into basin transfer. Yes, yeah. so basically, and we think you talked about it, is up through here, yeah. coming through this Merrimack, but then crossing, crossing through North Andover into Middleton, okay. into Derby, back, back as a backup. So I guess, so Mr. Clark is correct, and that's our, as I said to Stephen, in our drought, our past drought management plan, that was the backup to the backup was a connection with North Reading. We have the ability to, up there right now, we know a hydrant to a hydrant we could connect to to get an emergency water from North Reading, which would actually be coming from Andover, from the whole Merrimack River Valley up there. Um, in order for us to get water from that basin, it would require a state interbasin transfer. The state would have to approve it. Um, so obviously we, we've got to look at the other sources. First, the, the river in our coastal basin. What can we do there? Then it's we're looking at MWRA, and then we're looking at our permit standards. What, you know, can we use our wells more? Um, those things, but that interbasin transfer from north of us, it's, it's another option, uh, probably not the top one at the list, but something that will be considered in the future. And so if we had that, the, a third well not in the Ipswich River basin that was in a coastal plain basin, would there be a good chance that there would not be the limitations of the use of that based upon the river flow of the Ipswich River? Too early to say, but we know we're not in the basin. So going right in, we know that gives us hope that we'd have less restrictions on that well. But Thank too you. early, I, I can't sit here and say there wouldn't be any, but yep. we think there'd be a lot less restrictions. Thank you, David and Stephen. Add on yes. to that, I guess. I just want to clarify a couple things. So yeah, it, sorry. <laughs> um, so if we're looking at potential groundwater sources in the North Coastal Basin, you are likely to still need an interbasin transfer permit because you would be pulling the water out of the North Coastal and using it within another basin. So, I mean, that, we don't know yet. We've got to evaluate that. Um, I also just want to, as a hydrogeologist, you know, <clears throat> it's, it, you can't just go anywhere and drill anywhere in order to get a viable source that's going to give you the volume that you need, the yield, right? Um, so just want to put that expectation out there that it's not a slam dunk just because there's some shading on the map. So that has to be evaluated on a site-specific basis, right? Um, and then land use. So there's other constraints and uncertainties that would need to be resolved in terms of <coughs> is there enough space? There's a 400-foot protective radius that's supposed to be, um, you know, that, that's required. Um, there's also um, water quality questions. Um, so those are things that would have to be evaluated in, in taking that next step. No, the Very early in the stages for that. But. MWRA request would not require an interbasin transfer, even though we're transferring water from the Swift River Basin out in New Salem, Mass, to Danvers. Mm, no, I, I think it would. So, yeah. so there's a different permitting process because of the legislation that's been set up for the MWRA. There is still a permit, however, they have a safe yield allocation that is dedicated to the state. It's much less of a process similar to what they're just, when they just went through offering water to Wilmington, no, we did, saw what they did in Reading, and most recently what they, MWA offered to Peabody. So they have the ability to get through that process. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Sir, Mr. Bennett. I really don't know what to say. We've been talking about a shortage of water, or storage problem, if you will, since 2002 when we had that last drought. The potential for 74 days of buying water is a likelihood at the cost of $2 million. And we just keep talking about 
transfers from river basins. I would think, Mr. King, yep. Mr. David, that we should really come up with a plan to react to this issue. We know the problem. Yeah, I think and I mean, part just, of that will be the drought, drought management plan, um, gives us scenarios. And how old did you say that, that plan is? How old? Well, yeah. It's oh, right now, it's, it's going to be updated since. It's got to be. It's got to be updated right now. Um, we're still relying on the 2000 plan that doesn't include our actual water management act uh, permit. So we've kind of have to. We'd have to use the permit constraints and tie in our, our drought management plan to work the best the operate as uh, efficiently as possible with our, our water sources. So I'm not suggesting we go fast forward because then you make mistakes. But I'd like to see a plan of action that we can at least attempt to put into action. Absolutely. Well, that's what yeah. Do. Yep. Yeah. And I think, it, uh, Dan, in some of the slides indicate we have, we've been operating our plant below our permitted amount, yep. right? And, and part of that is driven by the, the, the constraints and restrictions that are put on the system through regulation. That's a separate issue from what we do during droughts that are, that are, that are going to continue to occur. Um, and we do have options right now to uh, provide water to our residents. They're fairly expensive, but we, we would not be in a position where we wouldn't be able to get water. You know, good point by Mr. Bartha, and I wanted to add to that, was that under our old permit, we have the, 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 the levels at the reservoir and the dates at where it should be. It, it, I, know, I know where that reservoir should be every day of the year in normal conditions. I know uh, if I can look at the elevation of it, if it's a mild drought, serious drought, we can look at that. Those numbers are still there, and we look at them. Um, the action steps that we would take in an emergency situ situation or during a drought, um, we know what those are. It's purchasing water. It's running our wells in excess of the permit. It's looking at North Reading. It's buying water. We know what the steps are. Uh, and we just implemented some of them when we just had the problem at the treatment plant last week. We put our emergency plan into effect. We had plenty of water in town. We know what they are. Um, we just want to codify them with the report and make sure that you know, even refine our accuracy on it, Mr. Bennett. So what we know what to do, we just want to clarify Right, but then you're plan. reacting to an emergency situation that you can't plan for. Uh, well, the, the one thing that we have now, and when we do this new update of the plant, is going to be tricky because it's drastic steps that we're going to have to take. So when the reservoir's in, say, a moderate drought level, do we start buying water then? We need to, we're going to have to think that through. Um, when it gets to a you know, more of a, it's a drought, but not a severe drought. Are we going to start running the wells more? What exactly is going to be that trigger? You're right. And it's so we're not reactive, but they're, they're drastic steps. Another step is a full outside water ban. When are we going to impl implement that? It's going to be part of it, but it's a drastic step that has a big effect on our customers. And we want to, and we're going to have a plan that says, yep, when the reservoir gets to this level, that's when we need to do it and say, and really enforce it, no outside, like we did in 02. All right, and in the meantime, you'll watch the water run off from Emerson Brook to <laughs> yeah, thousands right. of gallons or whatever. Yeah. I think, and then that's, I think that, I think everybody's in agreement with the, with the latter <clears throat> point where, you know, the ideal future situation is that we can operate a system and have adequate water where we don't have to tell residents based on the day of the year what, what they can and can't do. And if that's a, you know, we, we, wanted, we, we looked at f not necessarily from a feasibility of permitting perspective, although we think even under the current administration, getting permitting in place to try to do a, a new reservoir is, is likely a non-starter. But the question has been, how do we provide adequate supply? We wanted to look at the reservoirs. We, we think from a cost feasibility perspective, they not, may, that may not be an option. Um, we, we know that the MWRA has capacity. We know that the DEP has expressed concerns about the Ipswich Basin. We know that legislators are starting to talk about wa water in the context of climate change. So the, the timing is right, uh, to, Mr. to Ms. Ryan's point, to sit the legislators down and ta start talking about if, if there's an interest on the state side to see uh, more communities go toward the MWRA, then I think we want to engage them in a, in a conversation about those significant upfront costs and see how serious they are about making that option viable and feasible for communities. Um, so the, 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 the last two years have provided a lot of data and I think answered questions. And um, to your point, I think it's time to, to figure out if we're going to pursue a course of action, what is it? I think Thank that's you. a great point. I mean, the next step is really getting into, you know, working on our conservation as, as much as we can until the new Water Management Act comes out. And we can so uh, my colleagues asked a lot of my questions, but I do have a couple. 
we sit here between the three of us who are, uh, with over 11 years of experience, some of us a little bit more on the board, and sometimes it's hard for us. We know some of this detail. Uh, you're explaining not only to us, but to the people who are watching on cable or will watch on cable. And so I, I might ask a couple of questions that I think we've probably asked in the past and may maybe collectively know the answer to in the room, but I think it should be expressed so that people who, who may be gleaning this for the first time understand the constraints we're under. Um, one is, uh, you talked about opportunities. If we went up five feet. Well, what is the reality? Because our options are, A, find another source, or okay. increase our well uh, usage, yep. or go up, go down, or go out. So w with our existing, with the, with the reservoir existing supplies. reservoir supplies, when you say go up five feet, what, or uh, it whatever that solution is, what, what, w what would it entail to do that? I mean, we're looking at a $20 million hookup fee, we're looking at $2 million per year um, if we have to buy under some of your scenarios. Well, what would it take to go up five feet and a rough estimate of what it would cost to do that? Is there a five-year ROI on that? You know, is it a $10 million or a $20 million or a $30 million project to go up five feet in capacity or not? Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, if, if we do raise the, ele the elevation of the reservoirs, either at Emerson, Brook, or Milton Pond, um, you're definitely going to look at inundating the surrounding properties. I know we own a lot of property on Emerson, Brook Reservoir, but not on Milton Pond. So you have to look at relocating some property owners from their existing from their existing houses if we if we go that route. Also, it's it, it if we the projections hold true, and we go up to 2035 as far as actually building a, a dam or raising the ele elevation levels. It, it, it will show on the next slide over here. Sorry. But you may not get your rate of return on that investment. Because if we get anything more than 15% demand increase between Middleton and Danvers, we're still going to have to purchase water beyond doing that. So, so while you're on, on that number, what is the average increase in population in the town of Danvers year to year, roughly? I mean, 15 sounds well, like a demand. big number. I don't think it's people. It's Demand and people. It's a, it's yeah. Okay. Both. It's, yeah. Yeah. And we've looked at census. We looked at census data. We looked at uh, MAPAC. We've looked at MassDOT data, and they're all averaging for Danvers and, and Middleton somewhere between eight, eight and seventeen percent. Okay. I want to be ultra conservative and say, let's say, call it fifteen percent for us in our in the presentation today. Okay. But so we going up. So going up five feet means going out. You have to go. If you go up, then the water is going to inundate and go out as right. well. It's Correct. not like we have a wall that we just have to add more five feet to. Correct. What about going down? What about dredging? Dredging, I think, is a whole other issue. Yeah. So we looked at that. <clears throat> when we looked at we looked at dredging the bowl at Middleton Pond mm -hmm. last time. In the the cubic, because it's a small bowl, the cubic feet that we get is very small. Okay. It costs the same, and it, and we don't get any big quantities of water and then we have to put the spoils somewhere so that we should study that one last time and it was a non-starter uh, that's okay. what we looked at coming up this time at middleton pond did you study emerson brook that's got a much larger surface area in a lot of areas you could leave all the dredgings on islands right in the, in the lake so emerson brook we ran into the same permit problems that if we dig down we change all those wetland classifications so we're right in violation of the wetlands protection act same thing as when we put the water on top and I think this is where we've, we keep running into the same problem. When we, when we talk about the, the, the permitting when, when the town ran into the wall some 20, 30 years ago, um, even, even under the change in administration, which is, I think is sort of charted a different course from the EPA perspective, they are still deferring to states and asking where the state DEP on these issues. And, and we have not gotten any indication um, that there that will be a variance waiting for us at the end of a process to do something like that. That's correct. So that is one of my other questions. What's the constraint? Is it based on the state or the Fed? And if you're saying even though the Fed may be changing their, relaxing their federal guidelines, it still they look to the state, and the state would be the constraint. And I think the three Ultimately, the three yes. pieces of the, the the chart on the screen you have, the potential cost. And I and I to be fair to Steve and Dave and, and Kirsten, this hasn't been evaluated from a construction, you know, with with a with a at a granular level. So it, it could be. 10, 20, 30 million dollars to go up the five feet. 
then there's the question of the permits. And then there's the real issue of if, if we see growth in demand, we may be expanding the reservoir and still not keeping up with, not solving the problem we set out to solve at, mm -hmm. the, at the beginning. Um, which is why I think the, inter, the, 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 the basin exploration within Danvers, I think, is something worth pursuing. And we certainly, we, we need to engage the legislators to talk a, a little bit about whether MWRA is a long-term option to supplement our current permitted you know, allotments and what that would look like. And you also spoke in one of your slides about the fact, and I think, David, you also spoke, and Ms. Ryan spoke, about those emergency situations that push us over and require us to go over our permitted amount. What are the penalties for doing that? What, I mean, you know. Uh, it, so in our Water Management Act permit, right now, if we go over that summer cap right now, it, it says we have to put enhanced conservation measures in place. We do those already. We already have an enhanced program. However, there's a clause in there that if we do go over, the DEP can take other action should they see fit. And that was one thing that when we went into the permit, we, we saw what the summer use cap is. We fought it hard, fought it hard, because we knew it was going to be a problem. And we said, we can't have you guys penalizing us $10,000 or some number a day if we go over that summer cap. So what it is is that they can they do the enhanced conservation, which we do, and they can take other action, uh, but they would have to talk to us about it. The summer use cap is going to be a big topic when we get into this renewal. That's the real cap on our permit. You can see we're well below our 3.72 average per day for the year, but it's that summer cap that is on Danvers. And we need to check on who else has that summer cap like that, but that's our biggest restriction, and it's going to be a, a big negotiating point on the, when we go into this renewal, because it doesn't allow for any for, future growth. What is the time frame for the renewal process? So the renewal process has started in some of the towns in the area. Uh, the town of Hamilton, they began their renewal process last November. We believe they're going to come to us last, is what they told us. So we could get a we could get a, a letter tomorrow that says we begin the process. When was it supposed to have started? Oh, over a year ago. Yeah. So we're in extensions of our permit right now. <clears throat> we've, we've been ready. Process. I just want to make clear we, we we've been ready to to enter this. With a, it's been delayed getting out of the, from the state back to us. So are we perceived to be last because we're probably going to be the most vocal or vehement about this uh, and is being last um, a detriment in that we're basically building on whatever other agreements other cities and towns with different profiles in different situations have agreed to before us uh, it's sort of like if you have 10 unions that you're negotiating with mm. it's harder to deal with the 10th because they know what the first nine have received and gotten and, and, and you know, negotiated. The, the aspects of the permit that are very similar between other towns, we will be fighting what they've done, uh, such as uh, <coughs> they'll be regulating the groundwater sources in Hamilton and in, in Wenham. So they're going to try, they will try to uh, make our restrictions on our groundwater sources similar. However, we are different. We're both. We're surface water and <coughs> groundwater, and we serve another town. So those will be factors we'll be bringing up in the negotiations, how we're different. I think those are my questions. I want to thank you. Um, Ms. Ryan, as a hydrogeologist, you didn't get a lot of opportunity to speak. Is there anything you'd like to, to offer to the, to the board uh, in terms of? No, I, I mean, I think. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we have people, we have I cameras, about the cameras and I'm sorry. cable. Um, no, I just really appreciate the opportunity to work with the folks of the town of Danvers. Everybody's been extremely helpful, um, and very much engaged in the process that we've been going through, looking at all this technical information. I, I was actually uh, still working at the same firm. We were formerly SEA back in 2002 or three and four when there was Emerson Brook was being very closely looked at, and um, you know was at the the meetings with the regulators when they basically said you won't get a permit for this. So, you know, I'm familiar with the history and the level of detail that went into that evaluation um, to look at Emerson. I, you know, it was a good deal of effort and money. And I, I think I think we're on the right track here with trying to maximize the efficiency of using all your existing sources. You guys are maximizing your conservation efforts. We're going to take a look at, you know, are there ways that can be improved? What's working the best? 
And then looking at these other long-term solutions, you know, I think um, MWRA uh, potentially, potentially another groundwater source is, is the right, right way to go, and, and hopefully the state will support the grant funding application to uh, take that next step, help you guys with that. Thank you. Gentlemen, anything else? No. Thank you very, very much for the very thorough presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. At this point, the uh, board will discuss the fiscal year 2019 <coughs> management compensation. No, it's one item. Oh. Skipped. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. The board will consider a one year appointment to the Danvers Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, this item uh, was tabled for several meetings, um, waiting for some direction from the uh, Housing Authority Board. Uh, just as a quick background, um, the uh, the legislation governing how these boards are constructed changed two years ago, and um, one of the uh, one of the local seats will become a uh, an appointed seat um, once regulations are put in place to determine how that seat will be filled. Uh, that seat belonged to Wayne Eisenhower, and the board um, extended his uh, term by one year last year in anticipation of those regulations being uh, uh, put in place. They were not. Um, so the, the board asked uh, at a previous meeting um, whether the housing authority um, supported that uh, reappointment. And, and at a subsequent meeting, they met and discussed it, and they did, by a vote of four to zero, recommend that the board um, ap appoint Mr. Eisenhower for an additional one-year term, um, <coughs> which will expire uh, once the regulations are in place and a permanent member is, a, is appointed. And the letter you received tonight is a letter from Cindy Dunn uh, to that effect. We did this t table this to we need a motion on table it. We'll just go right to a motion on the application. I think we're already on table that by just putting it on the agenda. Okay. All right. Like so I'll accept a motion on Well, can I have, ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, Steve, you talked about um, appointing the um, new position because um, the letter says to elect the tenant representative. That's what they're waiting for is regulations. We, the, until the regulations are promulgated, there is no process to do that. So that we're There's no process to elect the tenant representative. For that fifth, for that fifth member to be, to find their Well, a third board. member. That's correct. Okay. So the recommendation for the appointment, it's not necessary as the tenant representative, just a member of the board. The, the seat currently held by Mr. Eisenhower is, is no longer uh, a seat on the board. And there will be uh, the, the process for filling the seat he currently holds will change once those regulations are out. And in the interim, the board would like to have five members so that they can make it easier to conduct if business. If they feel best to have the five members, then that's fine with me. I just I would have not voted that way if I was on that board, but that's okay. So unless there's other... <clears throat> I don't have any other questions, Mr. Clark. I just wish that they had nominated a, a tenant, no matter who it is, right. to represent that position rather than a person who is not a tenant of the authority. Because as of now, the tenants have no voice on the authority. And that was the idea of the law changing that seat so that the tenants would have a voice in the uh, uh, administration of the Danvers Housing Authority. Just to be clear, I don't know that the board has the authority to to randomly seat somebody, um, as the law stated that it, you know, the um, that position, the, the 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 person whose seat was set to expire in 17, no longer existed in its current form. Wh whether the board had the authority to to choose somebody else to fill that seat is not a question we explored. Well, they've they've, this is the they've direction chosen they've, Wayne. That's correct. This is the this is the direction they've supported at this point. The will of the board. Again, I guess the Danvers Housing Authority um, Board of Commissioners voted four to nothing um, to support that appointment, and I'll make that motion to do so motion with reservations. I'll, re I'll reluctantly second it. Motion made and seconded. Any further comment, gentlemen? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. 
Uh, now we move to the board consider uh, discuss the fiscal year 2019 management compensation plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of the uh, management compensation plan uh, process and updates this year. Um, and at the conclusion, uh, we'll be looking for two uh, actions from the board. One will be to support uh, the uh, performance evaluation uh, that was conducted uh, by uh, Finance Director Travis Ahern and I before he left. Uh, and the second would be to adopt uh, the management compensation plan um, as presented and with any adjustments that the board um, want, uh, saw fit to make. Um, so let me start by uh, describing uh, the process. This is a, uh, the, the management compensation plan um, is a performance evaluation program that was adopted by town meeting in 1979. It's been conducted each year since then. Uh, and it essentially puts in place merit-based pay for uh, management uh, employees in the town of Danvers. Uh, the, the plan itself, uh, meaning the documents used, have changed uh, from time to time. Most recently, in 2017, um, town meeting member Coley Rybicki has assisted the board in updating my <coughs> performance evaluation uh, <coughs> instrument. Um, and the management team liked that. It was a more streamlined version. Uh, it took a lot of the same... Uh, measurement areas and distilled it into a two-page document. So that was adopted for them as well last year, which we uh, continue to use. Um, supporting the management compensation plan is the uh, the salary range structure for uh, the management employees. Um, and uh, that had last been updated in two, the early 2000s, I think 2002. Uh, so we, with the, there was an appropriation in the budget last year to conduct a small compensation and classification study for that group. Uh, we were able to uh, secure a grant from the state through their community compact best practices program, which allowed <clears throat> us to expand that study to all non-union employees in the town, uh, which is a group uh, working for the town of about 60 employees. And that would be the senior management, um, along with a lot of the employees who work in this building in executive uh, uh, confidential uh, secretary roles um, and some of our assistant uh, division heads um, so that the, the second phase of that plan is still being completed. That's for the non-management uh, positions. But for the managers, the plan was updated for the, the, the 21 uh, employees who fall into that group. Um, a couple of the takeaways from our study, uh, which looked at both uh, external equity to make sure that, uh, to, to see what the market uh, suggested that an employee in a particular position uh, is earning both across the Commonwealth and within a peer group, uh, for the town and then also internally to make sure that the uh, the grade system for each of the positions um, was supported by um, the certifications and education requirements uh, the scope of their uh, authority uh, the amount of risk that they manage in their in their day-to-day -day operations and and largely what we found is that the system was 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 still pretty solid after after these years one of the changes that was recommended and, and is presented in the materials tonight is to expand the number of grades within the management uh, program from five to eight uh, to account for the differences between uh, a lot of the positions that we have. Um, and uh, secondarily, the, the, the top and the bottom of the ranges um, were, were close to where they needed to be. So that was nice to see that after 20 years, the ranges were still um, a good representation of the market. Uh, of the 21 employees who were uh, examined through this process, um, we found 80% of them uh, have uh, salary or compensation that is competitive with the market based on the number of years uh, of service that they have. We had a number of positions, uh, five in total, uh, that came out of the study with a recommendation for a modest salary adjustment. Uh, the largest of those adjustments was $4,000. Um, the, the smallest was $2,000. Um, and those five positions were uh, the senior and social services director, uh, both the fire chief and the deputy fire chief, uh, the assistant town manager, uh, and the, the new position of Director of Land Use and Community Services. So those were the kind of the, 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 the large findings from the study. And then um, within the evaluation process, which really starts, uh, it started a little bit uh, around this time last year, uh, each, em each uh, employee and their supervisor establish a number of performance objective goals for the year. Um, you'll see in the materials that were provided uh, which is listed under Exhibit uh, B. I wanted to provide for you, uh, this is not a complete list, but this is a snapshot of the, this is Exhibit B in the materials. Uh, Got it. It's a snapshot of the objectives that were set at the beginning of the year. 
many of which were completed this year, some of which are longer term projects like the last one on the, the list, which is the Smith School project. Um, but some of the highlights here, I'll just, I'll just note that one of, the, one of the goals out of the police department this year was to enhance our mental health uh, training and awareness among, among our police department. Uh, we have a crisis intervention uh, training uh, certification that officers are free to pursue now, and a significant portion of our department has achieved that. And one of the chief's goals this year was to expand the, uh, the training around that. Um, you, you'll see number seven, we've, we've been working uh, to, to roll out the, the fiber network um, with the, uh, the mothballing of the copper systems um, and the cost to uh, contract that through the telecom, we found it was cost effective to build our own network, which really um, gives us sort of best in class operations, but also sort of sets the stage for a number of variations where we could be providing some sort of internet service at some point to, to residents or businesses. Uh, number 12 is important, that's updating the water distribution capital plan. Um, that was something the town meeting supported last year and, and we're well underway in getting that document put in place. Uh, the fire chief has been focused on updating some of our emergency planning documents, which I think, uh, you know, we, we uh, the, the town had a, a, the last major uh, event in 2006 with the chemical explosion, but I think the, what happened in the Merrimack is a reminder that you know, we need to be regularly practicing and, and preparing for these things. So the, the fire chief has taken that upon himself to work on that. Um, some of the planning studies we've been working on for LaBelle's Grove and, and the Haybarn. Um, Rich Maloney just took on a couple of uh, students from Essex Tech in the, in the uh, building department. He has an electrical student and a plumbing student shadowing his inspectors. Uh, we want to give these students a, a view uh, from the uh, permitting side of the fence before they go off and get jobs in the construction side and, and hopefully they'll be applying for jobs for the town someday. Um, and something I'll mention are the manager's update. Um, one of Pam's, Pam Parkinson's goals for the year was to, was to uh, receive accreditation again for the senior center, which she did, one of 120 centers across the country that hold that designation. Um, and uh, 23 on the list was the, the Maple Street zoning that was supported uh, by town meeting in December. So this is, these are the kinds of things at the beginning of the year that you know, the division heads and department heads are sitting down and discussing, things that they know are coming and will be important to, to departments. Um, and stakeholders and selectmen and whatnot throughout the year. So that, that process um, is started in the fall. It's completed uh, at the close of the fiscal year. So August, uh, July, August into September, we're, we're conducting the actual evaluations and rating uh, the employees against the, the five categories um, uh, that, that are sort of the, 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 nece the necessary areas to be proficient in their jobs and then those uh, performance objectives that they've agreed matter for the year. Um, and there's a, there's a discretionary component to the evaluation, uh, which is weighted at 10%, which is to cover those um, items that were unknown at the beginning of the year, but <coughs> propped up during the year and, and required a significant amount of attention and skill to complete. Um, so I've, I've noted a couple of the highlights. Um, if, you, if you go to page four <coughs> of the uh, uh, memorandum itself, there's a there's a snapshot and and uh, <coughs> the 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 raw numbers themselves looking at the performance from year to year are a bit skewed um, in 2016. But when you look at the percentages of where people fall, uh, it's pretty consistent. Uh, the, <coughs> you know, the between quality and commendable, I think the, the management team uh, has done a good job. Um, that that was borne out through the through the scores and uh, based on the appropriation that was put in place at the Maytown meeting. Um, funding is sufficient to uh, offer the, the merit increases through this plan, which range from 2% for a quality performance up to 3% for an outstanding performance, as well as the handful of uh, market uh, or pay equity based adjustments <coughs> um, that, were, that were identified through the, through the study. Um, with respect to the town accountant's position, um, the finance director and I rated uh, Ms. Grace as commendable this year. Some of the some of the highlights were a, uh, a yet another clean audit, which is really kind of the, 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 lar the, the most important measurement uh, tool for a town accountant. Um, she and her staff have dedicated a lot of time this year to uh, ramping up the time and attendance software uh, that the town has invested in um, to, to digitize what has been a paper-based um, time accrual tracking system for uh, forever, frankly, um, and also um, some, some turnover within her department 
um, that was not completely unexpected, but the timing of it uh, occurred this fiscal year and allowed for onboarding a new employee as well as um, a, a promotion, which was well deserved within her department. So, um, so in a nutshell, that's that's the plan for the year. Um, you'll the the last several attachments in your materials show um, where the positions align within the grade system, um, and I also provided uh, the updated. Um, salary range chart as well as last year so that you can know differences between the two and uh, so again I'd be happy to answer any questions you have but I would be looking for two uh, action items one would be to uh, support the uh, the rating for the town account and then to implement the plan itself question John mr. Uh, I'm all set thank you mr. Clark I'm all set I think we covered everything in the executive session we had to cover I too am all set. I have no questions. I'll entertain a motion on accepting the um, result of the uh, of, of the uh, evaluation of the town account. Town account. I so move. I'll uh, make a motion. We accept the uh, evaluation of the town account as presented to us. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, then I'll entertain a motion to accept the management compensation plan as presented. I make a motion that we accept the management compensation plan as presented. Second. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Three nothing. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Back to our agenda. Time to report to the board on various items of interest. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I have a few updates for you. Um, first are a couple of pieces of correspondence that were uh, received after the agendas um, were out that I wanted to, uh, to provide and update you on. Uh, the first is a letter from uh, DHCD uh, notifying the town that um, uh, through the 40R zoning district that was approved by town meeting uh, in the fall uh, that the town has qualified for a $200,000 um, incentive payment that can be reinvested into the downtown. Um, how that will uh, work is to be determined. Uh, there are a number of uh, contract documents that we'll have to execute with the state and get some guidance from DHCD. Um, but I would <coughs> to discuss during the town meeting um, the, the kinds of projects that this money could be used to support. Uh, could be um, some sort of facade program for the downtown or um, looking at creating civic space or green space within the downtown or, or some sort of other um, improvement in the downtown that the planning board or a number of boards express uh, interest and support for uh, through obviously engagement with the with the business community but this is not an unexpected letter but it's a nice one to have formally on file and it'll allow us to, to enter into the contracting stage to find out what the parameters will be for for how to reinvest that money the second bit of correspondence um, as I noted during the MCP update uh, we did receive a letter from um, the National Institute of Senior Centers notifying us that the Danvers Senior Center um, has once again been accredited. And uh, one note here, unlike um, some other accreditation processes, the, the Senior Center process really starts over every time. So you're not updating your previous accreditation. Uh, you really go through the full process again. It's a pretty exhaustive process. Uh, we received some nice feedback from the, uh, the accreditors both in their meetings with us and uh, noted in the letter. Um, and on the, the second page of the letter, I would point out three of their recommendations to the town for the future had to do with succession planning um, and review of safety planning, which is something that the senior center will be working on with, with police and fire. But the third recommendation is, is examining uh, or trying to create a way for, for uh, staff at the senior center to stay up to date and current on their, on their training and professional development. And uh, the, the creation of the position earlier this year in partnership between the town and the Danvers Community Council uh, uh, for an assistant senior and social services director position really addresses both the first and the third bullet. Um, there will be a, a, a management position uh, that the council is supporting almost 40% of the cost for that will both run the food pantry uh, for 15 hours a week and then also be available within the senior center for 25 hours a week to support uh, the programming um, and service needs for our growing senior population uh, and really supporting Pam uh, in her in her service delivery which is I think um, a nice 
uh, it's a nice step and I think had the position been created prior to the accreditation process these recommendations might have looked a little bit different so they were reaccredited and I think that's a real uh, testament to the work that Pam and her staff do at the senior center uh, the third item you received is a draft um, of the uh, calendar for 2019 um, I had Ann email this to David and Diane since they were both unable to make it to tonight's meeting. Um, I'm going to recommend no action tonight on this, but uh, if you take a look at this and you see anything, any dates uh, that are of concern, you can share those with me now or you can send them to Ann in an email. Um, she's asked David and Diane to do the same and then we'll be able to bring this back at one of our next meetings to, to, to finalize. Mr. Chairman, can I make a comment on this? Absolutely. So uh, not so much the particular dates Steve, but in looking at, we have an election on May 7th, we reorganize on the 9th, and then a new chairperson gets thrown to the wolves on the 21st or the 20th for town meeting. So I'm wondering what was the thought process in reorganizing just before town meeting and not after? And why not have the chairman take the whole year right through town meeting with that budget? I think one, I'll start by saying that's a good question and we haven't, Joe may, the, the town clerk may have more background on that than I do. One scenario where this would play out would be if the chair were up for election that year and were not reelected. You'd have a situation where it there would. was no chair. So yeah. We need to reorganize prior to town meeting in that scenario. But an, under normal circumstances <clears throat> where the, if the chair were not up for reelection, I think that's, I don't, I can't, and again, the, I'll defer to the clerk. I, I don't know of a reason why you can do that. Mr. Chair, uh, I can add a little bit of historical perspective. It was a custom uh, long held that the chair would be a member who would be up for election in that May, on that May, and so that's why they, um, they reorganized uh, right after because of the fact that um, uh, the chances there could be there was a chance out there that the chair uh, the uh, person was not reelected. But that of course that, I mean that would be a past practice that yeah. would not that would be non-binding on a current board if it chose to. It's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It was pretty, it was pretty so I mean I, I throw that out there for a conversation and thought process. Um, It's not it, so. There's no. There's no rule stating that the meeting of the ninth would have to be the reorganization. So I just put that out there. Maybe next month we can discuss sure. it. Maybe not change it this year, or maybe change it or talk about it. I just think it's worth just having that conversation. I mean, there's always what if. Sure. Okay. Thank you. There's also a chances of chances are, chances are the next select next selectman chairman will be a present member of the board and will have background in this information, right. which has happened the last 11 and 13 years for yeah, us. This is true. Yeah. It's a good question. I haven't thought on that. All right, just something to think about. And the other board members may have some thoughts. I mean, I'm not suggesting anything, but I'd like to have a conversation. Perhaps. Sure, I think we have a conversation. Next, my, next. My, my immediate thought is that the li high likelihood is, unless the chairman's supposed to be reelected and isn't, um, is that the four or at least three of the board members who will be on the board will be knowledgeable. And if we generally, historically, have never elected a chairman from n candidates who, re who just got elected. Right. I'm not suggesting they're not knowledgeable. Just the yeah. chairman's the chairman and. Sure. He's removed prior to town meeting, and that's yeah. where I'm. Why remove them? Why not just continue to town question. meeting, and then on the following meeting after the 21st, the 21st I mean, yeah. reorganize? Yeah. I mean, there's no, I'm sure there's no right or wrong answer. Yep. It's just that, to my way of thinking, that might make sense. Yeah, for, year, for years, it was. The one of the members who was up for re-election in May was the chairman, was, yeah. and that's the way it held for, for many years, and that's that's where that's. Um, All right. Well, sorry to give you something to think about, but yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so we'll, yeah, yeah I, if, if you think of things after tonight that you want to sh shoot an email. Right. Them, no, I just I, I, I didn't want to send that in an email. But I've got that noted at the bottom here for when we bring this back, we can have that, Thank can you. Have that discussion with, with the full board. Um, one other update that the clerk may want to jump in on just briefly early voting starts next Monday. Uh, it'll be uh, conducted during regular town hall hours uh, and offered from eight to noon on Saturday, the 27th of October. Um, and uh, the state has agreed, I believe, um, Mr. Clerk, to reimburse us for part of that cost for the Saturday that we will be open, which is an optional day for us that we've, we've decided that's, we, we did that last time and we think that was, a, well, was well worth doing based on the turnout that Saturday. Um, uh, the, the clerk uh, chaired a very uh, uh, productive and efficient meeting uh, of a number of town departments a couple of weeks ago in preparing for the election. Uh, we had this, the, uh, a number of divisions from Public Works was there, the school department was represented, the police department was there, um, town hall staff was there, and uh, the, the schools have agreed that the field house is an appropriate venue for the election this year, given the uncertainty of what the turnout is going to end up being. This is not a typical mid, uh, midterm election, we think. Um, and there are a number of ballot questions which may bring, bring people to the polls. Um, and I would just note, having worked in a number of towns, that the, the meetings that the clerk uh, convenes to prepare for these elections is not something you see everywhere. It's not typical to see the buildings division, the streets division, the school department, the police department sitting down and, and talking through every um, detail, including making sure that light bulbs are replaced so that we present a good uh, face on election day and making sure that the sawhorses we're using are presentable and not um, outdated and reviewing the parking plan for probably the sixth year in a row even though nothing has changed just to make sure everybody remembers where they're supposed to be when so I, I would just want to make that note I think uh, um, the polls generally go pretty smoothly in Danvers and it's not by accident I would, I would, if, if Joe wants to add to that he's welcome to but no I think you uh, okay get all the major points thank you while we're on that if I might ask um, because some questions came up and Joe handled them very uh, appropriately last year or one of the last elections can we um, can we identify the closest point for which people who can politic mm -hmm. uh, hold signs whatever it was there was there was some question and sometimes it's you know just gentlemen's agreement and we've always done it in this place and, but when someone who may be from out of town who may not know um, if we, I don't care if it's a sign or no, no, you know, no signs past this point, no buttons past or whatever it is that satisfies the your election uh, um, location guidelines. Mr. Chair, I can mention that state law requires 150 feet. And a number of years ago, uh, there was a, that question did arise. And uh, I stepped it off. And uh, with the, with the, actually with a police officer, Billy mm -hmm. Carlton and I stepped it off a um, uh, number of years ago, as I said. And actually, 150 feet ends up before the, you get out to the corner, uh, right. where that's traditionally been the spot. Uh, uh, we found over the years that some of the people coming in to vote get intimidated by whomever that's standing on the corner. We tried to get everybody to stay at the corner and beyond just to give them some space. But the truth be told, 150 feet is about halfway down the sidewalk uh, from, the, from the entrance. And we try to maintain the same distance. Um, um, in November, we will have the uh, auditorium entrance in, in place because uh, students at the high school will not be in session. That day, there will be parent-teacher conferences for a small portion of the day. But generally uh, speaking, the uh, students will be not, not in the building, so we'll be using that auditorium entrance. And we'll establish 150 feet from, from that auditorium entrance also. But um, that's, that's what it is. Uh, Jeff, from, for years, the corner was always the, 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 um, the marking and right. everybody stayed at the corner and beyond, but uh, 150 feet does allow you to come closer to the entrance. Understood, and I just, you know, I sometimes it's by lack of understanding because it's people from a statewide race, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's people pushing the envelope, and I guess I'd like to know where the envelope ends. Mm -hmm. I, I do find, personally, the, the complaints that we get on election day are generally 
people that are concerned of, and, and intimidated, and, and that's why we like to keep them back to the cost. And, and, that, and that's the right. Yep. yep. But it's also a matter of impeding the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, that is true. Um, so maybe a um, maybe a uh, when you work with the police department, maybe the, the 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 point person can make sure that people don't feel they they have to push past people on the sidewalk. Yeah, I've I've always requested it and 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 politely asked anybody that's holding a sign for whatever candidate to be uh, courteous and observe that the and allow the voters uh, free passage to and from the. Uh, polling location and generally it works thank you thank you two more updates and uh, I'll turn the mic over um, you received a fairly uh, thick packet of information uh, tonight which you certainly haven't had the opportunity to read yet but we sat with the EPA yesterday uh, to get an update from them um, and to discuss the presentation that they will be making next Thursday uh, the 25th at Riverside School um, to update uh, community members on the uh, Superfund site uh, that is sort of centered at 55 Clinton Avenue on the on the west side um, of the river, but also extends across to the east side uh, and, and affects 45 and 35 Water Street, uh, which are condo associations as well as a, a, an MBTA right of way that runs the length of that side of the river um, toward 128. Um, so the uh, the testing has been taking place on both sides of the river for the past two years and the EPA has reached a point where they would like to discuss uh, their cleanup plan uh, with the impacted uh, neighbors and, and anybody from the community who's interested. Uh, so they've, we've, we've got the, the gymnasium at Riverside School uh, scheduled for next Thursday. Uh, starting at 6 p.m., the EPA will be making a presentation to stakeholders in terms of where they've been with their testing and what it is uh, that they're proposing both in terms of uh, impact and cost and timeline, uh, et cetera, for uh, the cleanup project. Um, from 7 to 7.30, uh, there will be a, a, a question and answer session with staff. And then starting at 7.30, uh, this, is a, this is a requirement under the Superfund process, but there will be a public hearing uh, where stakeholders can come and be on record, but there's no back and forth. They don't, this isn't a question and answer period at that point. It's, um, and the EPA is not allowed to respond, so they will open it up at 7.30 for anybody who wants to be on record um, on the project to, to be heard, um, and then that, that will be incorporated into uh, the, the project record. Um, the best case scenario at this point uh, is that construction could start about this time next year on the cleanup project. Um, so the, the purpose on the 25th is to really to talk to impacted residents um, in terms of what's being proposed. Uh, Steve King uh, uh, was in the meeting uh, with EPA at this point. He's, he's sort of the, the point person within the organization on this project, um, as, as is the case on most of the projects that we do that involve the state or the feds, um, such as the Liberty uh, Bridge project or the Ash Street cleanup that's going on right now. We like to have a staff uh, member or members available to residents um, <coughs> so we can get information locally and not necessarily have to go through the state or the feds to get questions answered. So Steve will, um, has ably filled that role and will uh, fill that role on this project. Uh, the EPA did, they, they sent out 1,400 uh, note cards to uh, butters uh, on both sides of the river, um, as well as the press release which you received in your packets tonight. I think the Salem News also ran an article this past week on the project. Um, and just yesterday we provided the addresses of all 15 uh, precinct uh, uh, three members uh, so that if they wanted to attend, they would all, if they live outside of that, many of them are included <coughs> in the butter list, but if they're outside of that list, we wanted to make sure they also had a personal invitation uh, to the meeting. Um, this will be a lengthy process. I think that on the, <coughs> on the 55 Clinton Avenue side, uh, they're talking about a 30 month uh, program to, to do the cleanup. It'll be, it'll be much more aggressive on the other side because that's where the residential units are and they'd like to get that project started and ended as quickly as they can. Unlike Ash Street, we don't anticipate uh, needing to find a staging area off-site. That ended up becoming an issue with the Ash Street project. Um, we had originally uh, staged the materials at Plains Park. Um, we had proposed to do it at Polk's Landing. Um, and then after a, um, a lively uh, discussion uh, with, with residents, it ultimately chose the Canal Street site 
uh, where the water and sewer facility was proposed to go. This side, because there, uh, the, the, there's a proposal to do some capping in place on the west side of the river on the 55 Clinton Avenue site, there's adequate space there to do that. So we, we don't anticipate needing to find any sort of staging areas for this project, which is good. Um, and then one, just one final note on that. Uh, we, we were discussing with the EPA the possibility <coughs> of, um, and I, again, I'll, I'll give credit to Steve, he raised this point, but when the, the, the MBTA right-of-way that is uh, slated for cleanup along that stretch um, is the, is the right-of-way that ultimately terminates outside of Town Hall, and if there's going to be remediation there, there's a real opportunity for that restoration to include um, a stone dust trail surface, which would allow ultimately for connection from Danversport up to the Elm Street parking lot, which would then be a logical uh, and very close step to the proposed Middleton Trail, and ultimately we could end up having the crisscross go from the Middleton town line to Danversport, uh, sort of east-west, and then from Peabody up to Wenham north-south, which would be a nice um, sort of, uh, I guess, peripheral benefit of this of this cleanup project. And I think the final, unless there's a question on that, but uh, so again, that starts at six o'clock uh, next Thursday at Riverside. Uh, for pre the formal presentation followed by questions and then the public hearing starts at 7.30 p.m. Um, and my last, just, this is an item we've mentioned, but I'll just, just as a reminder, we, uh, we've confirmed that we're going to do a, a Smith School uh, public forum uh, on November 1st uh, at 6 p.m. Um, at, uh, at the Smith School. Um, and we'll, we will uh, put that out. Uh, we gave a press release to the Salem News today. Um, we'll probably put a reverse call out to the community. We want to make sure that we ought, we'll get as many people uh, to this session and then the one uh, we're planning for December uh, at the middle school as, as we can to learn about the project and where, where it's been and where it's going. Uh, and that's, that's all that I have. All right, thank you. Any questions for the town manager on his various items? All right. Um, Board will consider the consent calendar items as they appear. Motion to approve. Motion made. I would like to make an amendment to that to exclude two items. One is the fifth item on the list, St. John's Prep Spring Open House, and the other item <clears throat> is St. John's Prep Fall Open House. I will be not voting in favor of those until such time as they cooperate with us in our request for pilot payments or some other kind of reimbursement to the town. Okay, um, so that we can I'll, I'll accept all of them except for those two. I'll, I'll vote for all of those. So motion to accept the consent calendar minus the two that um, uh, Mr. Clark identified. We can vote on those separately. Thank you. Uh, so do you accept that motion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, to the point of St. John's, the two St. John prep ones, uh, Mr. Clark, would you like to, do you have more further discussion? No, I just, I just don't feel if they're not going to cooperate with us now or ever, as the headmaster stated, um, we shouldn't <coughs> be doing things that are costing the town money to support their program until such time as they want to cooperate with us. This follows up on a discussion I've had with the town manager, and I'm not sure if we brought this to a public discussion or not, but I had asked what the cost of the banner hangings were. And I realize that we're getting into a uh, new field uh, here, but I, I agree with you. I agree if we have a civic organization, the, you know, the um, Riverside Square Dances, if we have the Kiwanis, if we have Family Festival, those all enhance the quality of life in the town of Danvers and wouldn't look to charge them for banner. They do have to go through the banner pro process. They do have to have some indemnification language and insurance, but I wouldn't, I would consider them, uh, uh, you know, er actually everybody else who's on here um, as good uh, uh, community citizens designed to help the town. Um, Mr. Town Manager, have you had any uh, opportunity to follow up and find out about cost? Yeah, it the, w what's required to hang a banner is, is generally uh, one or two bucket trucks, depending on the weather. Uh, and uh, so, you know, somewhere between two and three hundred dollars is generally the cost associated with, um, you know, taking staff off of a project. Um, it's, it's something we think it's important that the electric, you know, division as the division of the town do to support, you know, what's happening in town. But uh, in, in terms of a, you know, determining what a cost would be, we would probably say two hundred dollars. 
Um, and the, the town clerk and I have had some discussions for next year because the, the, you know, the, the deadline process was upon uh, his office for banner hangings now would be to, you know, if, if we're going to uh, move that direction, we'd, we'd be looking at establishing some sort of policy to determine, and of course we don't, we don't want uh, you know, the board to weigh in on that in terms of whether there was going to be a de designation or distinction between um, sort of civic groups and other groups or something like that. All right, um, those two are excluded, so uh, at this point, I'll entertain a motion if it were to come, for come forth. Hearing no motion. Well, let's think this through. Um, a lot of these are <coughs> non-profits or not-for-profits. None of these not-for-profits pay anything to the community in the way of taxes. They certainly make donations, many of them, to the community in many different ways. None of them have assets of a million dollars, which was the threshold for our pilot. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that. I won't argue that. But uh, I recall that the pilot program the pi specifically right. identified those people we approached in the pilot program were those that held um, uh, land and building assets exceeding $1 million. So the, and we specifically omitted churches. Uh, uh, churches. Right. But, but that, you know, there are smaller nonprofits in town that we did not approach based on that threshold. I just don't see what makes there's any good to not allow them to put up a banner. I don't see that we gain anything other than drawing a line in the sand. I don't think it's, I don't I think it's worth, I, a, I don't think it's worth a conversation. So uh, I agree, and this is a principle for at least one of the selectmen. So yep, and it may be for others as well. We, so uh, I, we could entertain a motion to table this until we have a full board. It might be a direction we could take. Agreeable to you, Bill, yep. to table it? Yep. Motion to table those those two items to the next, put on the next consent calendar. Okay. Motion made and seconded to table those two items for future discussion. All in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank that you. will happen. <coughs> it is now correspondence, Selectman's new business, previous new business, updates, and Selectman's closing contents. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a um, constituent approach me about a concern on the rail trail, and uh, also it, it, when he wrote me the letter, it was an email, and we got other people following up on it. There seems to be a practice that's going on now where people are leaving the sports center on one, Route 114 in their parking lot, and instead of pulling out onto 114 and leaving, <coughs> they're driving onto the rail trail and driving down to Prince Street and exiting at Prince Street. Uh, there used to be um, large boulders on the parking lot at the sports center on 114 that prohibited cars from entering the rail trail and in, on at least three occasions, people have been on the rail trail when someone has driven a car down from that center and exited onto Prince Street. So I think that we ought to have the DPW and police department look into this to the town manager and see if they can mitigate the situation by either placing barriers at the parking lot of the sports center or somehow bollards along the way, although maybe the over the uh, bridge on 114 so that cars couldn't drive down from that location to Prince Street. I think there's, I think that's something we'll, we'll look into tomorrow and I, and I think it, uh, it would not be unreasonable to expect the property owner to mitigate that problem on their property uh, where it, where I it think exits. it's both ends of the property because where they're getting off is also a, is a commercial site. They're getting off at the Merrimack Valley distribution site. Well, this guy saw him getting off on Prince Street. But oh, okay. But the, ent the, the, Entrance the space the at the street. back of the fence behind the center is inappropriate, yep. and I think that we can engage a property owner in, in putting some corrective measures in place okay. immediately. It's not uncommon to read about people who inadvertently take a turn. Mm -hmm. Could we consider, I mean, a single, ba a single pole, and I realize that, that they would have to be removable for emergency purposes, 
But is there, can we look into a long-term solution where any street entrance has a post or a pole, one that can be removed by the police or fire uh, quickly enough, um, you know, if it's set where you can unscrew it or un disconnect it a foot off the ground, you know, or whatever is the appropriate clearance, but one that would, a yellow pole that would dissuade someone from going down there um, in the first place. I don't think it would, I don't think it would be an impediment to foot traffic or bikes. Um, I think the qu two questions that would come to mind would be how many are we talking about and the, we would need the MBTA to allow us to put a structure in there right of way. We, uh, we don't own that right of way. We have a 90 But we do own the sidewalk just ahead of it. That's, that's correct. Except I, that, again, it's something it's, for it's, consideration and in, in investigation. That. Thank you. Something else? Anything else, Mr. Clark? That's it. All right. <clears throat> Uh, I did receive a correspondence from the Beverly Regional Airport inviting the selectmen to an event on October 31st. I'll pass it to you so that you can see, uh, see um, the details. Uh, I also got <coughs> the um, letter that Steve uh, alluded to earlier about the, uh, from the DHCD, and we'll bring that to the Affordable Housing Trust meeting tomorrow uh, for them to see. Um, I have two things. Um, realizing it's early, it's still mid-October, this is the time people start thinking about um, Thanksgiving, and they start thinking about um, giving generously to um, uh, programs. I did receive, or I read an, yeah, a posting from Kathy Simon, uh, who is a volunteer at the People of People Food Pantry, and she's trying to get out the word that the people of People food, food Pantry are not going to be giving out frozen turkeys this year. Their facilities do not support uh, freezers and cooling enough to store donated turkeys that then can be redistributed. Um, so what they're asking is, obviously you can always donate canned goods. Uh, they're looking for gift certificates from Market Basket, Stop and Shop, the local, or if they could get a straight donation they will then, in turn, in your name, buy the gift certificates and, 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 uh, and make sure that um, packages will be made available for they feed about 500 people um, uh, on average in a month, so usually twice a month. Uh, obviously, Thanksgiving has a, a burst of activity. And so they're just trying to get the word out that the kindness and generosity of people who buy an extra frozen turkey um, is not uh, uh, is something they're trying to uh, change the focus on. So if people can remember that. The other is um, uh, I would also encourage people who are considering the giving not only to give to the people of people food pantry, but um, Debbie Marticio um, used to have a restaurant downtown, Ma Dukes, and uh, 12 years ago she started doing a Thanksgiving event. Um, it has grown uh, year after year. It's now going into its 12th year. Um, and last year she fed over 2,500 meals. Um, so the, the target this year, because of the growth and people recommending, is 3,000 meals. That obviously uh, is a very large cost, um, and she is doing a fundraiser under Ma Dukes and Friends annual Thanksgiving event, and it's not just uh, dollars they need, they also need, she's calling it her army. Uh, these meals are prepared and served. Uh, last year it was at Middleton, uh, um, but they also do a lot of, uh, they need people to drive and deliver them to various locations as well. So when you start thinking about it and you start your planning process, I would highly encourage you to consider both of those um, and, uh, and, and look to uh, offering whatever assistance and support you can. Um, Debbie's is uh, one where it's, it's kind of a good, uh, feel-good family event if you bring your children and participate in, in, uh, in being part of the Army for the day, uh, even the days before. Um, you get a unique perspective uh, on uh, the world around us and the need that is out there. So um, I highly encourage you to uh, consider both of these. Um, if you have any questions, contact the People to People Food Pantry about how you can best help them. Um, and uh, as well as uh, uh, Debbie Marticio. So um, those are my two comments. I realize it's six weeks ahead of time, but people start thinking about it now. Um, that's all I had. 
So at this point, I will uh, leave with the comments of Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Um, th about this time last year, I uh, suggested that we bring a particular restaurant downtown in before we gave them a liquor license because they're in violation of the bylaw prohibiting trash pickup before 7 a.m. And the town manager said they'd come up with a plan. He did. This board approved it, sent it to town meeting. Town meeting approved it. Uh, the attorney general approved it. But a year later, waste management is still picking up trash at 6 a.m. on Saturday mornings at this same location. So if it still persists, then when it comes time to renew liquor licenses, I'm going to ask that this uh, particular business be brought in to explain why they're violating the bylaw. Monday, the holiday, the 8th, somebody was picking up rubbish at 6 o'clock, banging dumpsters for 20 minutes. I don't know who it was. It was off in the distance. So while we do have this bylaw, I hope that when it comes renewal time that these businesses are made aware of it. I don't know if they've been made aware of it to date or not because the Attorney General's office just approved it a short time ago. So it's, we, we do need to get that notice out to these businesses. That this, It's mostly waste management right now. JRM has gotten the word apparently because they stopped picking up Tuesday mornings at 6 o'clock. So that's, that's it on trash. And just as a reminder, as inconvenient as it is, we do need we do need reporting in order to enforce that. I and called I as I saw waste right. management yep. drive right by my house. And uh, but if, if the police are notified, um, it, it, it's particularly helpful when there's a photo. Uh, we we have started issuing letters uh, notifying them first that the I mean they are all aware of the bylaw change, but we send them a letter first to say the next infraction will be a penalty, and we and we intend to enforce that. Very good. But we Thank do you. need we do need help to make that to make that work. I do call. Yep. I did take pictures of JRM. Came out great. <laughs> and I eat, sent them right off to the chief. Thank you. I didn't bother you with them. Um, that's all my new business, old business. So uh, is a habit. I'd like to remember remind people to thank veterans when you see one, and keep them in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Set the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Aye. Good night, Danvers.